The next set of symbols on our list are the form symbols. And of those form symbols, we're going to cover flatness first. As far as a simple definition, flatness is pretty straightforward. How flat is the surface? However, when we're talking about inspecting the flatness of a surface, it gets surprisingly difficult. In fact, it's probably one of the more complex or time-consuming symbols to inspect when considering manual hand tools. And just like we noted with the orientation controls, we won't see flatness all that often on drawings because it's already being controlled by other symbols. Profile of a surface, as well as perpendicularity, parallelism, and angularity on flat planar surfaces is already controlling the flatness of that surface. So really, flatness is only being used to refine any controls that are already controlling that form or being applied to the primary datum because that would be the only scenario in which we only care about the form being controlled. So let's take a look at how we're going to inspect flatness. We see here on this example that flatness is qualifying datum feature A. Once again, we see flatness on its own for this feature because that surface is the primary datum. We don't need to define its location or its orientation because everything else is located and orientated to it because it's a primary datum. This feature control frame is telling us that this feature is being held to a flatness tolerance of five thousandths of an inch. As always, the first step is to figure out what our setup is going to look like. And as you might notice now, we are in the realm of symbols that won't have datums listed after the tolerance value. But that doesn't mean we have no setup. In fact, our setup seems a little bit more complicated. The goal of the setup is to level the surface to itself. But what does that even mean? Our setup needs to accurately level the surface to itself. That means the setup is not accurate if it utilizes another surface and allows the orientation of that surface to set the orientation of our inspection. In other words, we can see here the surface on the bottom side of this flange is holding the part up and we're inspecting the top surface for flatness. If we utilize this setup and drag an indicator across that top surface, we would see that we might get an example measurement of 0 0.024 from the high point to the low point. However, this is simply checking parallelism with respect to this bottom surface. These three machinist jacks are the same height, and we're just offsetting that red surface away from our inspection plane, which is the top of our granite table. So this measurement is truly checking parallelism of the top surface with respect to the red surface and not checking flatness of the top surface only. However, it should be pointed out that the value achieved in this measurement can be used in an attribute sort of way to accept the feature, but we cannot reject this feature based on this value. In other words, if we did this inspection and we dragged the indicator across that surface and we had a value of less than five thousandths, we can accept this for a flatness error of at least five thousandths. However, if we did the same inspection and we got a value of more than five thousandths, we cannot necessarily reject that for flatness. Now, a lot of experts out there recommend using three machinist jacks and adjusting those machinist jacks so the points that are directly above those machinist jacks, like we show here, are perfectly level to each other. In other words, your indicator zeroes out at each one of these points as you traverse over the top of that point. Then you traverse the indicator back and forth and record the highest point and then the lowest point with respect to this new zero. While this is definitely a better option than the previous example, this is still simply checking parallelism to a randomly selected surface. And we say randomly because we randomly selected where those three points would be based on where we located our three machinist jacks. And so by following this method, we've selected a random plane created by three points from the surface. And we measure the high point of that surface with respect to the low point of that surface. And the difference between these two values is simply the parallelism error to a randomly selected plane. But once again, we should point out that this value achieved during this measurement can still be used to accept that part in an attribute way but we cannot use that value if it's larger than the flatness tolerance to necessarily reject this feature. So we get a value that's less than five thousandths, we can accept it for flatness. If we get a value that's more than five thousandths, we cannot reject that for flatness.
Finally, we can see here we've leveled the surface to its own three high points, regardless of where the machinist jacks are, and then any deviation lower than those three high points is our true flatness error. This value is very tedious to manually collect with a height gauge. But again, this is the only way we would be able to reject that part. If we were to find out that we have leveled the three high points, and the lowest point with respect to this plane created from the three high points is further away than five thousandths, we can now reject this part. Another method to level the surface to itself that's not so iterative is to use a gauge plate. The important part is that that gauge plate is large enough to cover the entire surface you're inspecting, and that the two surfaces involved are parallel to each other, at least to a high level of certainty. We would then take that plate and level it with a height gauge. We simply just need to make sure that that plate is parallel to the granite table. This method also ensures that we have leveled the surface to itself. But once again, at any point during this process, if we are able to drag an indicator across that surface and get a value that is less than our listed flatness tolerance, we can accept that part. We just can't use that value to reject it until we get to this point here. So during the inspection, you'll notice here that the indicator zeroes out in three spots, the three high points of our surface. And then the indicator needle goes only one direction. We have zeroed out on the high points and any deviation is in only one direction. Once again, the indicator should zero out at the high points and only travel one direction away from that zero. And this value indicated on our test indicator is going to be directly reported against the allowed tolerance for this feature. Now, at this point in the course, we've covered profile, parallelism, and flatness. And if you haven't noticed yet, a unique relationship exists between profile, parallelism, and flatness when we consider a flat planar surface, like the one we see here on the top of this part. We can refine profile of a surface with parallelism, and we can refine parallelism with flatness. Again, profile of a surface in this scenario is controlling location and orientation and the form, but we've refined the orientation with parallelism, and we've refined the form with flatness. But if we take measurements with the CMM and we get a point cloud that represents that top surface, we can see that we would probably have something like this. Maybe the highest point was at 3.003 and the lowest point was at 2.998. If we consider both of those points, we can see that we have a profile deviation of six thousandths because the most deviated point was three thousandths away from true profile. Now with this in mind, if profile of a surface is six thousandths, our parallelism will also be at least that. It'll likely be less, but we won't know for sure. The parallelism tolerance is able to move freely up and down, and it's not controlling location. The only requirement is that that tolerance zone stays parallel to the datum listed. But we know since our parallelism specification is 10 thousandths, and we know that we are at least 6 thousandths or less, we can pass this for parallelism as well. And we also know that flatness is equal to or less than the reported parallelism deviation, which in this case we don't actually know, but we know it's less than 6 thousandths. But that's not enough for us to be able to reject this part for flatness, because the flatness tolerance zone can move and rotate around in all directions as long as all of the elements of that surface fit inside this tolerance zone. So we can't necessarily reject the flatness, but we can do a little bit more digging to see if we've met flatness of 5 thousandths. However, if we drop this off and we consider that the values during our inspection gave us a profile deviation of 4 thousandths, we know that parallelism is also going to be equal or less than 4 thousandths. And we can also assume that our flatness will be equal to or less than 4 thousandths. So we can see that on this scenario, if we were to get a 4 thousandths reading for profile of a surface, we could accept parallelism and we could also accept this feature for the flatness specification of 5 thousandths. But once again, we don't actually know what the flatness error is or the parallelism error is. We just know it's going to be equal to or less than 4 thousandths. As we mentioned back in position, another thing to keep in mind is we don't need multiple point clouds to check these tolerances. We can use the same point cloud to check each of these specifications separately. Now, there are those unique scenarios where we can apply flatness to a feature of size, and this scenario here is one of them. This flatness callout is applied to the feature of size, 
We know this because it's attached to the size dimension and directly associated with it. This feature control frame is telling us that we're controlling the derived median plane of this feature and is being held to a flatness tolerance of five thousandths of an inch. Remember, when applied to a feature of size, the interpretation changes. The tolerance now controls the derived median plane. And we hold that derived median plane inside the tolerance zone that is two parallel planes spaced apart five thousandths. So if there's any form error for this feature of size, the derived median plane will represent that form error. So in order to inspect the derived median flatness, we need to do a couple measurements to understand the form error that occurred for this feature of size. The first step is to measure the local size. And again, any local size must be verified that it lands within the size limits listed for this feature of size. So for example, let's say the local size is 1.012. For size dimensions, we also need to make sure to measure the envelope. So we're going to go ahead and measure the location of the worst case deviation with respect to the granite surface, which is calculating our worst case envelope. For example, this envelope might be 1.016. Now we're going to use these two values to calculate the derived median flatness for the derived median plane. For this example, the derived median flatness equals the difference between the worst case deviation and the local size. So we can go ahead and subtract 1.012 from 1.016. We would see that we get a flatness error of 0 0.004 for our derived median plane. This passes inspection because our tolerance was 5 thou. However, this method only holds true if the local sizes are all the same. What do we mean by that? It's important to note that if the local size does vary, in other words, any measurements with a caliper and micrometer are different depending on where you take them, the location of that variation will determine the amount of derived median plane flatness, which is very tricky to manually inspect. So designers, keep this in mind. When we look at these two examples here, we see that the local sizes will vary, but they all need to be inside our size tolerances. So we can go ahead and physically measure the envelope and the local sizes. And we would see that if we did some sort of calculation, we might be able to report some reported flatness error. However, reporting that flatness error is a little tricky because we don't necessarily know where in 3D space those local measurements are with respect to each other. Tracking where those local measurements are with respect to each other in 3D space would either give us some reported error or, like we see here in these new examples, zero reported flatness error because the local measurements are centered on each other. These scenarios here would report zero flatness error on the derived median plane. For this reason right here, inspecting derived median flatness on a feature of size is very difficult with manual equipment. We need to track where the local measurements are with respect to each other, or assume all the local measurements are exactly the same, and we can do a basic calculation like we saw in the first example. For this next example, let's consider adding the maximum material condition modifier to the feature control frame and see if the interpretation changes at all. We can see here now our example has the maximum material condition modifier applied to the feature control frame. This means that the derived median plane of this feature is now being held to flatness tolerance of five thousandths of an inch when we measure at MMC for this feature of size. So the combination of form and size allowed will contribute to a worst case boundary that must never be crossed. This boundary can be calculated as the MMC plus any geometric tolerance when it does measure at that MMC. In other words, our boundary from the granite surface up is 1.020 plus 5 thousandths, which gives us a boundary of 1.025. Because the modifier is present, this boundary can easily be checked with a height gauge and reported using attribute data. We can simply tell the inspection report that yes or no, this feature fits underneath that boundary.